So next we have our keynote speaker, Riyad Abed. Um, Riyad has a, a long history and, and, uh, and has been really a, an important figure in evolutionary psychiatry uh, over the last, well, almost 30 years, I guess, Riyad. Um, he, uh, he was a lecturer at a, the University of Sheffield and a practicing psychiatrist for many years. Um, but he's now retired and uh, I'm happy to say is working full full pace on building evolutionary psychiatry as a field. He's built the um, Evolutionary Psychiatry Special Interest Group of the Royal College of Psychiatrists. Uh, he's revived the uh, the section of evolutionary psychiatry at the World Psychiatric Association. Um, so he's really uh, been a, real, uh, a, a force to change in the field and we're very lucky to have him here today. Um, so yeah, let's see, can you try the clicker? Yes. Um... Thank you very much. Um, there's a little bit of overlap between my um, uh, my presentation and uh, Alfonso, uh, and that actually is reassuring to me because I, that proves that I'm on the right track. Um, I've actually got some of the same uh, diagrams, but I'll whiz through them. Um, so if you agree with any version of the title of my talk, that would make you an outlier in the world of psychiatry because very few psychiatrists of the 400,000 or so psychiatrists around the world actually would agree that evolution is relevant. Um, and um, the reasons for that are many and varied, uh, but I think that uh, one um, major, uh, I think, um, concern or fact uh, is that um, there haven't been um, enough um, interventions that are based on evolution. And I think doctors being uh, 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 practical um, people who are concerned with clinical applications with their patients want to, to see uh, things they can use in the clinic rather than theoretical models. So that, that's the challenge that faces us. Uh, today. Um, my argument in my presentation is going to be that um, any um, understanding of mental health and mental disorder um, is going to be incomplete and maybe even seriously flawed without evolution. Um, uh, but I will also recognize that um, evolution psychiatry is, is yet to translate its promise uh, into um, real-world um, clinical applications, um, although I think there is uh, there is the potential there. So um, just want to flag up these two um, groups. Uh, if you're not a member of of, uh, of these, consider joining. Joining is free. Either the section of the evolutionary psychiatry at the WPA or the evolutionary uh, psychiatry specialist group at the. Uh, Royal College of Psychiatrists, and both of these are multidisciplinary uh, groups, and we welcome um, all professionals um, in, in uh, as members. So uh, these, some of these books have already me been mentioned, but um, I'd like to just uh, flag up that there are books that haven't been. Um, uh, Stevens and Price um, was the first in 1996. Uh, and that, that's the cover of the second edition in, year, in the year 2000. And of course, um, Alfonso's book in 1998 uh, and um, the first edition of Martin Bruner's book uh, in 2008. And this is the second edition, 2015. Um, Marco's and Randy's books have already been mentioned. And our volume, again, kindly uh, mentioned by uh, Adam. So I don't need to... Um, uh, uh, mention it again. So uh, there's wide recognition that psychiatry has some serious problems, uh, and this is not just an evolutionary critique. This is this this comes from uh, the leaders of the field. Um, so I'm going to just list uh, some bullet points uh, to summarize some of these problems. So um, it's. Mainstream psychiatry has an exclusive focus on proximate causation. This is prevalent in the whole of medicine, of course. This is not just uh, psychiatry. 
um, there's no coherent model of normal human psychological and emotional functioning. Those outside the field might be surprised uh, that this is the case, um, but it is a fact. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, many psychiatrists seem to live with this um, without, without any problem. Um, uh, also, it confounds, it tends to confound distress with disease. Um, and there's no agreed concept of what constitutes a mental disorder. Now, I'm not claiming that any of these problems are easy problems to solve. They're actually quite hard. And the application of evolutionary theory is not going to instantly resolve them. But I think it's a necessary first step. Also, the current uh, classification systems suffer from the twin problems of heterogeneity and comorbidity. Uh, there are many uh, psychiatric interventions. Uh, well, well, many psychiatric um, interventions are either uh, questionable or of partial efficacy. Um, and unlike many other branches of medicine, for instance, cardiology, which has been transformed out of all recognition in the last 50 years, and oncology that has led to major breakthroughs in the treatment of cancer, psychiatry has actually made little progress in the treatment of depression in the last 30 years and in the treatment of schizophrenia in the last 60 years. And this is not, again, an evolutionary critique. Um, other problems, mainstream psychiatry is characterized by unconstrained pluralism. Now, pluralism is not a bad thing in itself. Pluralism can be a sign of vitality and dynamism, uh, and there should always be space for, um, uh, uh, for new ideas and new approaches and so forth. So that, but unconstrained pluralism can point to some serious flaws and weaknesses um, in, uh, in a discipline. And I believe this is the case in mainstream psychiatry today. So uh, there are trends that range from the abiological, which is the social psychiatry, transcultural psychiatry, cultural psychiatry, and right across to the hyperbiological of, of biological psychiatry. Um, and these are very influential uh, trends in psychiatry today, and they've actually made some good contributions. But as evolutionists, we would look uh, with some concern and maybe a lot of suspicion to uh, a, a, a science, uh, an abiological approach to the understanding of human nature and human psychology. Uh, but I think we should be equally concerned about the hyperbiological um, um, approach or position of biological psychiatry, which is characterized by eliminative reductionism. So um, now reductionism is not bad in itself. Um, it's one of the most powerful tools of science, but uh, there can be some such a thing as bad reductionism. Um, philosophers like Dan Dennett uh, call it greedy reductionism, but I prefer the term eliminative reductionism because it's more descriptive. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, uh, this um, uh, refers to the neglect of emergent properties or emergent phenomena. Um, and the, um, uh, the assumption that the emergent phenomena, such as mood, cognition, behavior, are nothing but events at a particular receptor or circuit. Now, this can be misleading for two main reasons. First of all, the, um, uh, uh, the end product of selection is actually the emergent property and not the event at the molecular level. Um, uh, uh, the reason for this is that the emergent property can be multiply realized at lower levels. That's to say it can be generated through uh, a, a diversity of neurobiological roots. Uh, the second reason why this uh, uh, can be misleading um, is that the, uh, 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 the, the sole determinant of function and dysfunction is in fact the emergent property, the mood, um, cognition, and behavior, and not the, um, uh, the 
uh, uh, the lower level or the molecular event. So the, to evaluate the functional status of events at the molecular level, one has to refer to the phenotypic end product uh, to, uh, 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 to determine that. So um, uh, biological psychiatry's tendency to, 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 um, uh, to look at or to focus on molecular events and events at the level of receptors um, and, circ and, and neural circuits uh, can actually have, uh, can impede our understand, uh, an, an adaptational understanding of the systems that we're dealing with. So um, the last point um, that I want to make regarding problems in psychiatry is biological psychiatry's uh, implicitly and erroneous uh, view um, uh, that the body, uh, or the, the view that the body is a, a designed machine. And um, uh, this leads to the um, to what uh, Randolph Nessie has termed tacit creationism. So uh, this uh, um, cartoon is taken from Alan Francis's book, uh, Saving Normal, that was uh, mentioned by uh, Ed Hagen. Um, and uh, he was the, uh, uh, the chair, uh, the chairman of the task force of, the D of DSM-4. And uh, I think the, the caption uh, uh, and also the title of his book uh, explains uh, uh, his concern. So this is the overlap between uh, myself and uh, um, Alfonso. Uh, 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 can um, evolution help address some of the uh, uh, some of these uh, some of these issues? Biologizing the human my, the, the, the human motivational system is one good starting point. Uh, and also, this is another overlap uh, <laughs> between myself and uh, um, uh, um, and Alfonso. This is um, Marco's mapping of the uh, of the human uh, motivational system. Um, uh, 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 Kenrick's um, uh, hierarchy uh, was actually a reformulation of Maslow's hierarchy. Um, uh, uh, they biologized it. And, ref and uh, referred the motivations to uh, the tasks of survival and reproduction um, and eliminated such high-minded and ambiguous uh, concepts as self-actualization. Uh, and um, so this can be a good starting point, of course, uh, to start um, uh, 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 understanding function and psychopathology. All evolutionary disciplines have evolutionary biology as their basic science, and evolutionary psychiatry is, uh, is no different. But evolutionary psychiatry has also benefited greatly from the work and insights in evolutionary medicine, evolutionary psychology, and evolutionary anthropology. Uh, and um, I've suggested that uh, in this diagram that there might be a two-way traffic with evolutionary medicine and psychology, but um, I think evolutionary psychiatry has benefited more one way from evolutionary anthropology, um, um, but I stand corrected if I'm wrong about that. So what? why has evolution not been incorporated into medicine and psychiatry already? And I think that the bottom line is we really need to um, demonstrate that uh, we are relevant in clinical practice, that evolution is relevant in clinical practice, and that's really the only way that doctors will um, uh, will start to uh, be converted to uh, evolutionary thinking. This is uh, this diagram was taken from a, an, an article by Crespi um, uh, a few months ago, where he outlined three obstacles: the obstacle of getting collaboration between theorists and empiricists, uh, between biologists and medical doctors and then between researchers and the medical industries, including the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and all of these are major challenges uh, which have not yet been met. So uh, I don't want to dwell on uh, Tim Biggins' four questions uh, in an audience like this. Uh, I'm sure you are all um, fully aware of uh, this. Just to highlight that we really need to um, uh, educate our non-evolutionary colleagues in mental health 
and um, uh, and in academia uh, uh, in the importance of this. This is the cornerstone of evolutionary thinking, um, and the the added value that um, that this brings is is the uh, uh, is is the um, uh, uh, the uh, the whole uh, domain of ultimate causation uh, or evolutionary or ultimate causation. What I do want to uh, highlight here is that the um, the proximate uh, and ultimate split that was uh, that originates from Ernest Mayer and then was elaborated by Nicholas Timbergen into two proximate, uh, true uh, two evolutionary or ultimate causes. Um, is slightly flawed, given that uh, development is actually not purely proximate. It is proximate in the sense that there is an immediate proximate cause at any moment in time in the process of development, but the functional trajectories that are taken um, uh, are, have been shaped by selection and therefore have an ultimate cause. And I would uh, propose a tweak of this um, so that mechanism remains purely proximate, uh, but um, uh, development or ontogeny um, uh, 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 is, is labeled as having a, a hybrid status with both proximate and ultimate cause um, uh, causation. Um, and um, uh, phylogeny and function um, remains purely uh, uh, with ultimate causation. This is a, a, a non-exhaustive list of the pathways to disease and uh, disorder, or rather the vulnerability to disease and disorder from an evolutionary perspective. Um, the, re the remainder of my talk is going to focus around mismatch. Uh, the reason for this is that it, it is probably one of the most important insights of evolution medicine, and it, it's, it is uh, conspicuous by its absence from standard psychiatric texts today. Um, and um, I will also touch upon some of the, uh, the other um, uh, um, uh, causes of vulnerability uh, in, um, in red. So this is a, a very basic definition of evolutionary mismatch. I'm gonna to also touch upon developmental mismatch in a moment, but I'm not gonna talk about that too much. So um, mismatch occurs when an organism suffers negative health uh, uh, and or fitness consequences as a result of living in an environment that differs radically from its natural environment or the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness. Um, this is a, an, a, 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 um, a basic illustration of mismatch uh, with regards to food and nutrition uh, demonstrates how a, a functional algorithm or adaptation uh, can have adaptive outcomes in one environment and a maladaptive um, outcome in a different environment, the very same algorithm. So um, the algorithm, eat the sweetest food you can find, uh, will uh, lead to encountering natural foodstuffs and, uh, ye uh, 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 and the uh, adaptive outcome uh, of uh, consuming um, um, uh, fruits and berries and so forth, yielding calories, vitamins, and fiber. And also, uh, but in the um, um, modern environment, will lead to encountering ultra-processed foods and, uh, uh, and a maladaptive outcome of uh, consuming um, high sugar, soda, sweets, pastries, yielding excessive calories, but low nutritional value. Just to, to uh, remind you that there's a different kind of mismatch uh, in the literature uh, referred to as developmental mismatch. This relates to individuals during their lifetime uh, when if the environment changes radically uh, between early life and uh, uh, a later adult life, uh, and early life refers to prenatal life, um, that this can lead to adverse health consequences. I'm, I'm not going to go into that, just flag it up as, as being there in the literature, and it's not the, the, uh, the kind of mismatch I'm going to be referring to. This table explores mismatch uh, uh, under five domains. Um, 
if you um, if you look at the the first row, um, that uh, refers to mismatch that occurs in uh, in the immune system. The modern environment differs um, uh, radically from the ancestral environment in that it is highly aseptic. This leads to a low uh, pathogen burden, which is obviously a very good thing, but even uh, such an undoubted good thing as a low pathogen burden uh, can have a downside, and that is the the lack of challenge to the immune system can lead to it misfiring, um, increasing the risk of autoimmune diseases, um, uh, metabolic syndrome, uh, and also depression. Uh, between 10 and 30 percent of depressions relate to chronic inflammation. Uh, the second row uh, um, uh, uh, relates to diet, and I've already touched on, um, on that. The, the, uh, the modern diet uh, differs from uh, uh, the ancestral diet in, in, in many important ways with its high carbohydrate and sugar content and so forth, leading to uh, adverse health consequences. Uh, low uh, physical activity, again, similar health consequences. Modern social conditions, living in proximity with many strangers, living in high density um, uh, population um, environments, and also the, the, the novel uh, phenomenon of involuntary social isolation, which I'll be saying more about, um, can uh, all differ radically from uh, the natural human environment, leading to issues of chronic stress, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, and so forth. Um, and also, of course, we are living far longer than our ancestors ever did, uh, and therefore our body tissues um, uh, become mismatched to the microenvironment in which they are in, leading to uh, degenerative uh, diseases, uh, and also, of course, increasing risk of cancer. So I'm going to say something about loneliness or involuntary social isolation, um, which is a novel um, phenomena um, in uh, human evolutionary history. Uh, it is, it is a, a phenomena uh, that has arisen in the modern environment and never existed uh, in the ancestral environment. Um, so uh, a survey in 2017 in the UK by the Joe Cox Commission found that 9 million people were often or always um, lonely, um, reported feeling lonely uh, in the UK. Uh, and uh, another survey by Age UK found that 31% of over 50s, again, uh, reported feeling lonely sometimes or often. 2018, for the very first time, the UK government appointed a minister for loneliness and the, the, um, I think one or more states in Australia have done uh, the same. Uh, and Japan also has a minister uh, for loneliness. So I don't know whether there are any, any others around the world. Uh, loneliness has devastating health consequences, which actually exceed the risk, certainly with regards to, to uh, premature death, exceed uh, the risk of smoking. So loneliness is higher on the risk of premature death than smoking and definitely much higher than obesity and physical inactivity. It is that, um, it is that important. Um, also, social isolation increases the risk of dementia, heart disease, stroke, depression, anxiety, and suicide. The question is why? Why does it do that? That's a, an evolutionary question. Um, uh, uh, sadly, uh, a lot of books and conferences and so forth uh, 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 discuss the issue of loneliness and its health, uh, uh, its health consequences without mentioning anything about evolution. I, I uh, um, attended a uh, uh, um, a conference during the uh, uh, the COVID pandemic organized by the Royal Society of Medicine on loneliness. And there were four speakers. Uh, not one of them mentioned evolution. So, and no why question. I, I, I would suggest that exploring the phylogenetics of human sociality might help. So, uh, of course, Homo sapiens is, uh, is uh, a species of great ape. 
Um, and great apes, unlike uh, herd mammals, in fact, monkeys also share the same uh, the same characteristic of uh, having bonded relationships. So it's not just great apes, but great apes um, have it in, in, a, in a more um, a clear and marked way. So the bonded relationships are enduring, individualized, intense relations with other individual members. So in other words, when a bond is formed, it is not interchangeable. Uh, it, 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 it becomes unique to the, those two individuals. Uh, that's not the case in herd animals. Um, so the size of the group and the number of bonded relationships each individual can have are species-specific characteristics and correlate with brain size, more specifically with uh, uh, cerebrocortical volume. So a solitary individual chimp uh, or ancestral human cut off from their group was unlikely to survive. Um, and in the ancestral environment, a state of involuntary social isolation carried grave, even uh, catastrophic fitness costs. Um, people might be uh, familiar with this um, uh, 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 with this nested hierarchy of human relations by uh, Robin Dunbar. Uh, this is also sometimes uh, referred to um, as um, uh, uh, Dunbar's graph, um, uh, and it, it is a, a series of um, concentric circles with the with the individual in the middle, and then. Um, uh, various circles of close friends, best friends, good friends, friends, and then there's a thick circle around the 150, which is referred to as Dunbar's number. Um, now, that is a significant uh, boundary. It separates relations uh, that can be altruistic, which is the inner circle, from transactional, which is the outer circle. Uh, and that's not a trivial distinction. Um, um, uh, uh, so that um, people are more inclined to behave altruistically uh, uh, with, the, with the inner circle than with the, uh, with the outer circle. Um, and 40% of our social time is spent with our five close friends. 60% with the 15 so that only 40% of our social time ca uh, will be devoted to the rest of the 135 or so um, uh, outside the circle of uh, close and best, uh, best friends. And of course, if you have, uh, if you have a social um, media profile of thousands, then, uh, I mean, the you know, amount of time that you can devote to, to each will be a few seconds, maybe in a month. Um, so there is a neuroscience, of course, to friendship and uh, social bonds. Um, there's a role for the so-called CT fibers. Uh, these are specialized fibers in the torso, which we share with the uh, great apes and with monkeys. Um, they are stimulated in the great apes in the act of grooming. Um, of course, we have lost our body hair, so, but we've retained these fibers uh, that uh, remain sensitive to stroking, patting, uh, and cuddling. Uh, of course, uh, the stimulation of the CT fibers releases um, endorphins. Uh, but on top of that, humans have devised social and cultural means of uh, releasing endorphin, such as communal dancing, singing, uh, communal rituals, organized religion, uh, feasting or banqueting, uh, communal consumption of alcohol or psych uh, psychoactive drugs, uh, and so forth. So there's a role, a big role for uh, the endorphin system and the feelings of well-being, and also uh, the lack of it in psychiatric morbidity. Um, there's also a role for oxytocin uh, and dopamine, but probably less role for, uh, for other uh, neurotransmitters and hormones. This is an interesting um, study uh, that was published in January uh, uh, this year that looked at depression and social support. Um, they, they looked at two groups, a younger group and an older group, a younger group of uh, newly um, um, uh, uh, graduated medical doctors in their first year of residency 
and they looked at a, a, an older retired and widowed group, both of these groups had high uh, polygenic risk scores for depression. Um, what they found was that uh, this group seemed to have a, a, a higher sensitivity um, to, um, to both the lack of social support and also to, um, uh, 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 to, to nurturing uh, social environments, that's to say, uh, good social support. So, um, and there was a, a dose response effect uh, with the PRS, with the uh, polygenic risk scores. So the higher it is, the more sensitive they were to, to social support. So um, it seems that there's something uh, 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 like differential susceptibility going on here. Um, uh, and um, it's, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, 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 it, it, this may be, uh, this, this vulnerability to, um, uh, to, to low mood with lack of social support may have been uh, hidden or dormant in the, uh, uh, in the ancestor environment because of the fact that uh, 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 involuntary social isolation was either temporary or rare, um, but then it became uncovered in, in the, in the um, circumstances of the uh, modern environment, uh, and this is obviously a form of mismatch. So um, mismatch has been implicated in a whole range of uh, psychiatric disorders. Uh, this is this is uh, a, a list where uh, where it, uh, it it has been considered. Uh, but I'm going to pick uh, eating disorders as um, as an example. So um, the, these are some of the characteristics of eating disorders that make them of particular interest to evolutionists. One is that eating disorders have been claimed to be novel disorders. Uh, that they have emerged in recent times, um, that all eating disorders are more prevalent in Western and Westernized societies. Uh, the evidence point to a significant increase in all variants of eating disorders in recent decades in Western countries, and that this now, this increase is spreading to um, developing countries in association with uh, industrialization, urbanization, and Westernization. This is, this is just a, um, to give you an idea of the range of evolutionary theories in chronological order um, on eating disorders. I'm not going to go through them all, but I'm going to discuss further my own theory, which is the sexual competition hypothesis. Um, this table compares uh, seven uh, evolutionary theories on eating disorders on seven parameters. Again, I'm not going to take you through them, just to I highlight to you that mismatch has been implicated in six out of the seven uh, 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 theories, um, um, extant theories on eating disorders. Other themes um, other than um, uh, evolutionary mismatch uh, that arise from the epidemiological uh, features of eating disorders include sexual selection, um, mainly female intersexual competition, and also the importance of phylogenetics of the human mating system. Um, I don't need to explain sexual selection in any detail in this audience, I hope. Um, this was um, um, uh, uh, first um, um, uh, identified by Charles Darwin himself in 1871 in, the, in, uh, in his book, uh, The Descent uh, of Man. And, they, and sexually selected traits are uh, referred to traits that aid reproduction, but may actually be uh, either neutral or harmful to survival. Um, in fact, there are studies uh, to show that the size of the peacock's tail, which is the canonical example of a sexually uh, selected trait, that the size and the plumage of, um, uh, of, uh, um, of the peacock may actually reduce their lifespan. But because they uh, are, are more um, reproductively uh, uh, successful, uh, this trait um, um, increases and spreads. Of course, uh, sexually selected traits are not don't exist only in peacocks. They uh, are common to all sexually reproducing organisms, including humans, and they lead to sex differences. That's a that's a um, um, important message uh, with that. So, sex differences become 
manifest uh, both in morphological and psychological differences. And of course, ooh, my goodness, any leeway? Um, so, uh, uh, and the uh, human lineage has uh, evolved a, uh, a distinct mating system that includes um, <laughs> uh, uh, that includes pair bonding, which has um, um, given rise to the challenges of finding, attracting, and retaining long-term mates. Um, uh, the, these challenges are unique to humans uh, and are not at all important in. Uh, uh, in species that don't have pair bonding, such as the chimpanzees, who do not form uh, long-term mating uh, or long-term mateships. Also, uh, males and females employ sex-specific strategies to compete with members of the same sex, um, and they diverge in some, not all, in some of the qualities uh, they desire in long-term mates. Uh, for example, males value uh, youth more highly, um, that's to say more highly than females do, and females value earning capacity uh, more highly. Uh, so according to the sexual competition hypothesis, the female typical strategies of mate attraction and retention that emphasize physical attractiveness are central to the understanding of eating disorders. This is just some elaboration further, uh, some further elaboration on the human mating system uh, that's characterized by pair bonding that I've already mentioned, which is absent in our closest ape relatives. Um, um, and um, the human mating system is also um, unique in that uh, uh, there is uh, uh, that men are high paternal investors and uh, uh, provisioners of mate and offspring. And this is absent in all other great apes. No other... Um, uh, 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 male uh, uh, great ape uh, provisions uh, their uh, their partner or or offspring. They may um, uh, provide protection, but they don't uh, actually pro uh, provide material goods. So um, a man's fitness uh, became tied up to the number of fertile years of a woman uh, he can monopolize. This is referred to as reproductive potential, and a woman's fitness became tied up to her mate's provisioning effort, that's to say his willingness and ability uh, 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 to provide. So um, uh, it's obvious, um, it's important to note that visual cues are much more effective at assessing uh, female reproductive potential than it is to judge a man's reliability as a provider. So uh, women have a, uh, a, a, a more difficult task uh, when um, evaluating a long-term mate than uh, than men do. The, uh, the nature of the exchange um, uh, in human long-term mating is uh, that of paternal investment in return for paternity assurance. Um, these are the evolutionary roots. Again, these are uniquely human. Uh, female competition for mates. Uh, female chimpanzees don't need to, uh, to compete for, uh, 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 for mates in this way. Um, and male choosiness. Again, male chimpanzees don't need to be choosy because they don't invest anything other than uh, they, what, what it takes to copulate. Um, so this is a statement of the sexual competition hypothesis, is that eating disorders are a manifestation of intersexual competition whereby autonomous females of reproductive age compete intensely with each other in the novel environment of large cities through the display of signs of youth and nobility through a strategy of the pursuit of thinness. This leads to runaway female intersexual competition, the extreme version uh, of which is eating disorders. So the sexual competition hypothesis is based on the idea that there's a mismatch between the design of the human female psychological adaptation of uh, for mate attraction and retention and for competing with rival females on the one hand and the modern human environment on the other. Uh, this is just a restating of the fact that sexual selection produces both morphological as well as psychological uh, adaptations. Um, so the nubile shape and the psychological uh, adaptation uh, uh, that motivate women to attend to their physical appearance in order to display uh, mate, their mate value in competition 
with other females uh, in their environment. And it's important to um, remember here that this is an, a, a context sensitive um, uh, response. So, um, okay, and the, the, uh, the bullet points in, uh, in red uh, list factors in the modern environment um, that intensify female intersexual competition. These are high levels of female autonomy, socially uh, imposed monogamy, declining fertility, um, uh, living in large cities, and media images of hyper-attractive young females that are mistaken uh, for competitors. This, uh, th just a word about the waist-to-hip ratio. This is how it's measured, um, and this is how it's studied. These are 12 line drawings um, devised originally by Devendra Singh, uh, an evolutionary psychologist from the University of Texas, with three weights and four different waist-to-hip ratios in each row from 0.7 to 1. Uh, and this has now been studied around the world. This is one of the big studies um, uh, which uh, um, uh, surveyed about 7,500 subjects from 26 countries. Uh, the main findings are that the vast majority showed a broadly similar body shape preference with rural areas preferring heavier bodies, uh, lower social e uh, economic status uh, preferring relatively heavier bodies, and increased exposure to Western media predicted preference for thinner bodies, and females consistently misconstrued males as preferring thinner bodies than is the case. And uh, herein lies a clue that this is intrasexual competition rather than intersexual competition. So any theory on eating disorders much must answer some really striking epidemiological features, which are why females, why reproductive age, why the particular geographical distribution uh, of eating disorders, and why have they emerged or increased in recent times. And you may be surprised to know that no mainstream, non-evolutionary um, theory on eating disorder explains any of these at all. So these are some of the um, predictions that I made in, in uh, 1998. Um, and the ones in red are the ones where that have been backed up by empirical evidence. They include uh, eating disorder patients will show a high level of intrasexual competition compared to controls. Societies with high fertility will show lower rates of eating disorders. Increasing female autonomy uh, will be associated with increase in the rate of uh, eating disorders and exclusive lesbians should have a lower risk of eating disorders, whereas exclusive male homosexuals are higher risk. Um, so there have been some studies uh, of uh, and some tests of uh, uh, of this um, hypothesis. Um, uh, three on non-clinical populations and one small study in Germany uh, in collaboration with Martin Brunner uh, uh, on on a clinical. Uh, on a clinical population, and we looked at uh, measures for competitiveness, for eating, uh, abnormal eating behavior, mate value, and life history. And and uh, I'm not going to go through the studies. The, the first three are um, non-clinical studies. Um, Lee et al. Uh, was actually a, a group I'm not connected with, um, um, uh, and those were generally supportive of the uh, sexual competition hypothesis. Um, the the last one um, uh, uh, is uh, is the small pilot clinical study uh, that was partially supportive, um, but that was um, very underpowered. I just want to say a word about male eating disorders. There seems that males have two variants of eating disorders. A male typical variant, which is uh, the drive for muscularity, um, and some males, and this is more prevalent in, in um, heterosexual males, um, uh, and a, a female typical um, uh, drive for thinness, which seems to be more common in homosexual males. Um, females only present with one variant, which is the drive uh, for thinness. And uh, uh, the, the drive for muscularity is when, when the man uh, feels that their upper body is too small and they want to get it bigger and more muscular. Uh, and of course, you can, um, you can see how uh, the uh, intersexual competition uh, uh, is playing uh, a role 
uh, in both of these presentations. Uh, the extended mismatch hypothesis is the most recent development uh, in, uh, in uh, 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 evolutionary theories of eating disorders. There's two variants. Um, the um, Aiton and, uh, and Ibrahim are uh, from the UK and Rantala et al. are, are from Finland, um, uh, Estonia and Australia. And I'm not going to go through them because I don't have any time. Um, uh, 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 and I'll just wrap up. Um, these are some of the strengths of evolution psychiatry. Uh, it recognizes ultimate uh, causation and uh, that acts simultaneously with proximate causes. Uh, evolution is unique in helping determine selections, phenotypic end products, and I've mentioned something about that. Evolution recognizes that human psychological mechanisms are not optimally designed, um, uh, are the result of trade-offs that create an array of vulnerabilities. It reminds us that psychic pain and distress can be a design feature of functional systems. Uh, it also recognizes the centrality of environmental context in the functioning of biological systems while acknowledging the role of genes uh, and development, thus offering a way to reformulate the nature-nurture uh, problem. Um, uh, and uh, with regard to clinical benefits, I think uh, I think Alfonso has uh, has really um, uh, discussed that in some detail. I would suggest it can um, improve rapport. It can help uh, with the process of normalization and destigmatization. Um, it can um, uh, provide a potential rationale for treatment. Uh, can help with the scientific classification system. Uh, it can guide future research into. Uh, the nature of mental disorder, um, and uh, it can help us better evaluate outcomes. Uh, again, um, Alfonso uh, elaborated on this, and I fully uh, agree with that, um, and may help us devise uh, uh, future novel treatments and uh, uh, or preventative methods. So I'll end with a quote from Albert Ellis, who was a pioneer in um, uh, applying evolutionary ideas to psychotherapy way back in 1957, and I think that was that was impressive. Uh, he suggested that evolution encourages the exploration as to why evolution has either produced or failed to eliminate psychological problems, uh, provides a humanist approach uh, of uh, mental health problems as arising from innate traits that can sometimes be advantageous rather than seen as simple, simply as defects, uh, and can uh, helps. Uh, patients understand the origins of emotions, cognitions, and behavior uh, in psychological problems. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Riyad. We have about 12 minutes for questions. We have quite a bit of time for questions. If anyone has a question. Oh, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Riyadh. Uh, my question was, Is there a, do you think there's a role for self-discipline in the model that you presented? Because um, so in the U.S. or the Western world, uh, ballet dancers are at particular risk. Uh, and that makes sense with the intersensual competition. But there's also a self-discipline aspect. And in India, it is men who compete through aesthetics to to be the one who can you know be the most uh, austere, eat uh, fast, the best. Um so, and yeah, we know fasting is used as a way to kind of signal self-discipline. Is there a role for self-discipline in your... Yes. Uh, conscientiousness has has been, uh, I mean, it's been found to be um, an important factor um, in, in the overall model that uh, that we have, uh, we've looked at. Um, but it is, um, it's secondary rather than, uh, so there's, it, it is secondary to the intersexual competition that that's uh, that's going on so uh, it seems that if you are highly conscientious and disciplined and you are engaged in intense intersexual competition then you may be able to endure the the um, uh, the um, dietary restriction um, uh, if you are if you are less willful you might become bulimic um, so you, you you will kind of succumb from from time to time uh, to to binging and then and then making yourself sick. Um, so yes, of course that that has a role, but it's not a primary role. Um, I think uh, the uh, um, the non-evolutionary approaches have 
have magnified the the role of um, uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, of conscientiousness uh, and um, obsessionality um, uh, um, and so forth and self control, um, but that will not explain the, the massive sex differences. We're dealing here with a very very skewed um, uh, uh, sex different uh, female to male uh, ratio. Um, I had a correspondence with uh, Pier Paolo, who's uh, sitting at the uh, at the end there. He, he works in a uh, in an eating disorder unit um, uh, because recently there's been a lot of epidemiological studies suggesting that the the f female to to male ratio is lower than what was thought before in the region of three to four to one, uh, rather than ten to one, which is what uh, 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 has been. Uh, the the, uh, the the figure before that, but if you look at those in inpatient units, they're almost all females. So it seems that you know it's like taking uh, a trait such as violence. You might say that violence can occur in females and males, but for the more danger for the most dangerous criminals, they're all males. There are no females, or they might be very very rarely the odd female. But you know, just as a sort of example, uh, there are no high secure um, female prisons in the UK. There's only high secure prisons for males. Um, just as an example of, of how the extreme can uh, be illustrative of, of what the nature of the trait is. Thank you, Riyad. We have a question from Jerry. Jerry, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, hi, thank you for your excellent talk. Um, I'm an Irish CAM psychiatrist and we have had an utter 440% increase in eating disorders and they've come forward by about 18 months in age from 14 to 12 with COVID. Given that it's not quite the asteroid hitting the earth, but given that it's an apocalyptic event, do you think the mass increase of eating disorders can be explained from an evolutionary point of view? Yes, I've, I've, I've been asked that question before um, I don't have a a, a a a definitive answer, but I wonder whether during the COVID pandemic, people became so involved in the social media um, uh, uh, that the the intrasexual competition um, got out of control, with uh, with uh, you know people uh, constantly observing and following what's happening to others. But that's just a that's just a hypothesis. I, I really don't don't have a definitive answer there. But that that uh, that issue has been raised uh, by others, and it's an interesting finding. Thank you. Can I answer a question that was actually put to put to Alfonso about leaving the office? Uh, I think I think the gentleman um, uh, back there. I was wondering, actually, um, because I'm really interested in um, Alfonso's model, the G-O-A-L, um, that maybe one proxy to do that uh, would be to uh, to have an outcome measure that is presented to a significant other, um, say a partner, parent, um, you know, uh, as as being a a proxy for getting out of the office is to get a third party. Um, intimate person's view of the functioning of the patient. I don't know what you think, Alfonso, of that. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I think it's absolutely right. The problem is that this source of information that we call independent informant should be allowed by the patient. Yeah, of course. Of course. By uh, consent, yes. Uh, by consent yeah. Another way, another way it was suggested by Tom Insel that after leaving the NIMH, uh, he found that this private um, uh, company, the name was MindStrong, and he said, we all use smartphone, okay? And the smartphone is with us the old day. So what about creating an app uh, that can uh, rec record the context of interaction, the way the patient is interacting in the real life? Um, of course, again, 
this requires the informed consent by the patient, but it's really a, a smart solution because these small devices can record uh, the audio, for example, for one minute or two minutes, okay? And you forget completely that you are using the app. And this gives information about your frequency of social relationships, the kind of content of the exchange between the patient and other people. This is a kind of, you know, uh, exporting what we call the ethological approach. The ethological approach means to study behavior in the natural context. And this was the big revolution in psychology about 70 years ago, because experimental psychology worked on rats in artificial environments. Ethologists said, no way, because this is not the natural behavior. We should observe the species within the natural context. I think that other devices in medicine are trying to do that. If you think about cardiology, okay? In cardiology, they use what they call the halter. So you bring with you the electrocardiogram for 24 hours or 48 hours, and the the outcome is completely different from what you, you record in the artificial environment. There is a study demonstrating that people looking at uh, soccer or football okay, games, they have variation in the heart activity that it's really impressive relative to the variation they have, you know, in the artificial environment of the doctor office. And that's what we want to know what happens to the patient. Cool. Um, I might have time for a little follow up. Actually, I'm not over time. Uh, no, you're perfect. Uh, 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 you tricked me, uh, Adam. Yeah, I, yeah. Sorry, I thought it was twenty-five <laughs> minutes going wrong. Apologies. It's so I can get, get this question in. Um, you were you were talking about anorexia specifically, and also bulimia a little bit in in your eating disorders hypothesis. I'm wondering what you think about body dysmorphia and specifically, uh, like being really into the gym. And I don't know if you've seen anything in the clinics, but anecdotally, at least, it seems like. Um, sexual competition amongst females, or at least the ideal body shape is changing from like the size zero Kate Moss thing to the Kardashian model and like very, very gym oriented. And you probably see more, well, I'm sure that you see more, uh, women taking testosterone to kind of bulk up and it's a very popular, so I'm wondering how this fits in there and what you think about, um, um, I, I'm I'm not I'm not aware of the problem of women taking testosterone. Did you say women? Yeah, yeah. Testosterone is that the the um, it's like bulk of bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sort bodybuilding. Of. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm not aware. Um, I'm I, I don't know much about that particular population of women bodybuilders, but but the the male bodybuilders um, uh, fit in with this with this model um, uh, very neatly. Um, uh, and certainly those those with a uh, uh, with a serious preoccupation um, with their with their um, with their upper body uh, sort of musculature um, uh, are, are almost exclusively men. There, I I don't know that there are any case reports, even case reports, of women having that particular extreme concern. Um, uh, uh, you know, but. But the the drive for thinness occurs in males and females. One of the one of the weaknesses, I guess, of the uh, sexual competition hypothesis is that, uh, or whereas it can explain uh, homosexuals uh, having a drive for thinness because they want to attract uh, other males, um, uh, it, it's it's difficult to explain the small number of heterosexual males uh, who have a drive for thinness. Again. They they are not great in number, but they are anomalous in, in with regard to this particular uh, theoretical model. Of course, as we know, all theoretical models are wrong, but some are useful, um, and I think we should remember that uh, we're, it, this uh, this theory doesn't claim uh, to to explain everything. Okay. Uh, thank. Oh yes, you have thirty seconds. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, I was wondering about the role of technology uh, with uh, the rise of eating disorders, but dating back in technology like mirrors and the incidence of having mirrors as um, 
a potential factor influencing this? Well, all of these things intensify intersexual competition. Right. All of them. I mean, this is this is part of uh, the um, the mismatch, I would guess, uh, of the modern environment. Um, we are not evolved to deal with media images. We're not evolved to deal with databases of you know attractive people all of whom are competing for the same mates as we are, were not evolved for that. Uh, and therefore, these will all be complicating factors that may increase the problem. Or even full body mirrors. I mean, not... Yes, yeah. of course. Great. Um, okay, Marco, thank you, Riyadh, thank you.